Good morning, guys, and again, we meet in a very unusual way, and I hope this gets done pretty soon. I hope you do as well. But we're going to celebrate this morning Palm Sunday, a week before Easter, and I, I, I put it out on the internet a couple of days ago, but I want to encourage you as you're watching this morning, start inviting your friends to Good Friday services at 1 and 6, also at our Easter service, which is going to be next Sunday morning, just at 8 o'clock. We're going to still try to all meet together, but we just won't be in the same room together. But the church is not just a place, isn't it? It's people. And so as, as God's people, we're going to gather. But hey, start a watch party. Just you know, invite your friends. Maybe we couldn't have gotten them out of bed, but maybe we'll get them just to the computer to push a couple of buttons. And you know, the, the, the message doesn't change even when the venue does. And so as the Lord has put us in this place, and this is what we have, so we make the most of it. We thank the Lord for what he's doing and uh, this morning we're going to talk about Palm Sunday, the, that, that time when the Lord came to present himself to the nation, a fulfillment of, of years of prophecy. And then we'll look forward to this week on Wednesday night, looking at the, that week of, of Passover, if, uh, if you will, and that, that approach to the cross, and then Good Friday and, and Sunday. We're looking forward to what's going to happen. So let's pray. I'm glad you joined us this morning. And uh, we'll just ask the Lord to speak. <laughs> His word never goes out void, even if we can't look at each other face to face. We have this great, marvelous kind of tool to be able to continue to minister to one another. Father, how thankful we are this morning as we gather that you are a God who is in charge. And though around us we, we see panic and fear, uh, upheaval and uncertainty, uh, no one is sure what comes next. Everyone is kind of confined, most of them, to their homes. Many jobs are lost. We don't really know where to turn. But Lord, may this be a time where, where we as a world turn to Jesus, that your message and your hope and your promises, your sovereignty, your oversight would become so clear. And even for us as a church, for Morningstar, may we, each one of us that call this home, find ourselves in a much better place in, in terms of wanting to just acknowledge you and, and serve you and realize that all of the things that fill our lives, which now are, are taken away, they, they don't impact at all our relationship with you. It's, it's still the same as it was before. It's either good or it isn't. It, it needs improving or it's, it, it couldn't be better. So speak to us this morning as we, as we look at your son coming to, to declare who he was and why he came and what he wants to do. And may you meet with us here and with our families here in our homes as we gather together. May you be glorified, we pray, as we come to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I guess we're all proving that church is not a building. So let's take some time and all worship together. Praise and honor our Lord and Savior. Open up the doors again. Let the King of Glory in. His kingdom will never end. Oh, I know that you are good. Break the darkness with your light. All the earth let praise arise. Every dead place come alive. Oh, I know that you are good. I know that you are good. who you are oh I know that you are good I know that you are good you will have my hallelujah you are the highest name all to you 
never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Kind of got me there. I almost got up. And, no, not quite done yet. Almost. All right, we're going to read out of the scriptures this morning out of Psalm 119, uh, sorry, 118. It goes along with our, our study this morning as well as it's one of the psalms that the Jews would have sang as they headed up to the Passover feast in Jerusalem. So have your Bible with you, get it out, and you can read along with us. Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. And let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me, and he set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me amongst those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desires on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They have surrounded me, yes, they have surrounded me, yet in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees, and they were quenched like the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I may fall, but the Lord has helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. And the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. So open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous shall enter. And I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he's good, and his mercy endures forever. Amen. Father, we can just imagine the thousands of pilgrims, the Jews from far and wide, with the privilege of spending a week together with their families, traveling on foot, uh, on, on donkey back or horseback, in carts, just finding their way home to Jerusalem, singing of your goodness and of your mercy, of your grace, of your, of your victory, the, the confidence that they have learned to put in you better than in man, better than in princes. As the nation surrounded them so often, it was the, the name of the Lord that caused them to be able to stand as a nation. That's true to this day. And so, Lord, as we just picture ourselves on the roads there leading up to the Passover week and, and that being the time when you would present yourself to the nation, a, a city filled with people who were there singing these songs and, oh, had it just been in their hearts and not just in their mouths, Lord, what you might have done. So speak to us this morning that these, this song would be more than just in our mouths. It would be in our hearts as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you believe this is the fourth Sunday that we're live streaming only online? And I can't say that I'm getting used to talking to a camera in a big empty room, but the awesome thing is, is I know that you guys are listening because I'm seeing you guys posting all those pictures on Facebook and Instagram. So keep it up. It's really cool to see the body uh, showing that they're tuning in and they're watching and they're staying up with, with God's word. So keep taking the pictures. We're seeing it. It's awesome. It's fun. 
Um, for some announcements for you guys, I want to continue to remind you parents from pre-K up to sixth grade, we're continuing to update the curriculum, so please go onto our website, go to the children's ministry, and there you're going to see all the curriculum listed for the different age groups, uh, and it'll just be a great way to spend time with your, with your kids and teaching them the Bible from those lesson plans, and I know if you haven't started it yet, please do so, because it's just going to, it's an easy way to just have good godly conversations with them and teaching them the Bible, so those are available for you, and we're going to continue to keep those posted. Um, do want to remind you, uh, Pastor Jack already mentioned, but for our Easter services, uh, all the different things that are taking place this week, we've got our Wednesday evening service that uh, we've got lined up a special, mes a special message uh, that's kind of taking you through the Passover week. So we're going to have that 7 p.m. Wednesday night, and then on Good Friday, we'll have our 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. both live streamed at those day at that time. Uh, so tune in on that, and and then most importantly, our Easter morning service. While we were planning on having at a field at 8 a.m., where well, we're going to have it on a great big online platform at 8 a.m. So we're going to have one live stream service. And then like Pastor Jack said, invite everybody that you can. There's these cool things on Facebook. Pastor Jack referenced the uh, hosting a watch party. If you have no idea what that is, Google it. I'm sure you're very good at Googling things by now. Uh, so check that out. Say uh, Facebook watch party and you'll get all the instructions on how to set that up. And what you can do then is have friends that you, you know and invite them in. You can all watch the, the service together in just a private little group uh, where you can comment and, and it'll just be a great time fellowshipping in a very different but uh, but a very real way. So that's this Easter, uh, this next Sunday, and it'll be a great time with the body. Um, and like I said, a very different way. But we also need to understand that, that just because we're quarantined, that doesn't mean that Jesus and his word is quarantined. So let's be very active in using the tools that we have uh, readily available to us to continue to share that gospel message. Because I know Pastor Jack has an awesome Easter Sunday message for us. And so I would encourage you to, to look forward to that and to not be disappointed, but to look forward to it and invite others because it's going to be a great day. Uh, also want to continue to remind you that you can continue to give your tithes online. It's very easy. Just click the give button on our web website and it'll take you to a secure place where you can uh, do your tithes and offerings through that. Uh, we've also continued to receive them through the mail uh, as well as people dropping them off in our office. It's been really cool because lately more people have been taking the time to write little notes. So everyone that's you know handed in a note to us through the mail or just walked it in, it's been really encouraging for us as a staff to, to read those notes and, and seeing how you guys are still praying for us and lifting us up. So thank you for all of that and, and for those nice notes. Uh, and then uh, lastly, just want to uh, let you know that we're going to weather this, you know. I know that uh, times are different uh, and difficult and in isolation and, <laughs> and it's, and it's, uh, it's weird. But I can say that the Lord is still good. He's still on his throne, and, and we're going to get through this. And I do want to let you know that if you are higher risk and you don't feel comfortable going outside, I want to continue to remind you to call the church office. Let us know of your needs so that we can help you in one way or another, pick up groceries or any prescription drugs that you may have because we want to keep you safe. So uh, we love you. We miss you. We can't wait to come together as a body again, uh, and it's going to be so great uh, when we have that, that opportunity to come back together. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for just um, all the things that we do have. Lord, this is a, a time where we really do get to reevaluate things in our life. The things that, um, that we took for granted uh, are, are now being taken from us in many ways, at least for the, the temporary means or purposes. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, we would reevaluate all those things and see how much they meant to us. Just the fact that we got to gather as a body, as a family every week, and then that now we don't get to. And how much that, that means to us now as a result of not having it. So I would pray that, uh, Lord, you would just remind us of the things that we do have and not take for granted of the things that we once had and that we can have them again and, and value them and cherish them as we get to come together as a body eventually uh, and praise you collectively, Lord. But we still do get to praise you uh, as your church, Lord, and we get to lift up our, our, our praises to you uh, as we sing, as we study your word, and we know, Lord, that, that you're going to be glorified in it all. 
Uh, Lord, we do ask that you would continue to just protect those that are, that are serving all the folks that are going to the hospitals and flooding them, Lord. I pray that you would just give them strength. And, and Lord, we do pray for, for just your word to go out, for revival to take root. Lord, I'm seeing all these videos of, of doctors and nurses praying together and seeking the Lord uh, to, to get through this and to see... Um, people healed and we just ask that you would can do great and mighty things that we would be impressed by how much you move and work and how lord so many people thought you were absent in these things and we're going to see how you show yourself strong through all these trials and difficulties father so we thank you for that opportunity to be able to see you work and move in a very different powerful way and lord we also come this morning with our tithes and offerings knowing that you're you're our sustainer you're the one that gives us all things that we need and we've got nothing to worry about, nothing at all, because you're good. And even if the worst case scenario happened to us, then we get to be in your arms. And what a great promise we have to to know that uh, that's our fate, that we get to be with Jesus and him glorified. So Lord, we come before you this morning and we just love you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? All creation groaning is a new creation coming. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, the conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is you worthy of this? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit? You are. 
We can not only speak, but sing your name and sing your praises. Yes. And it is in the name above all names that not only we have our salvation, but once saved, you call us to come together in your name mm -hmm. and to celebrate over and over again the goodness that you have brought into our lives. And we can praise you, Lord, whether in times of trial or times of abundance. Mm -hmm. Whatever we face, we can sing the name of Jesus. Yes, God. May we now turn to your word, Lord, and by your Holy Spirit, anoint Pastor Jack to bring that message 
and anoint our hearts mm. to receive what you have for your church here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, this morning we're going to open our Bibles, if you have them with you, to Mark chapter 11, verse 1. We are setting aside our concluding couple of uh, studies in the book of James for this Sunday and the following being Easter. And then we have two more, I think, studies in James on prayer. So maybe we'll be praying as we get out of this quarantine and, and get back together. But this morning we did want to consider this week before the cross, uh, Palm Sunday as it's become known. Uh, if you've read the book of Mark before, you know in chapter 8, Mark um, turns a corner, like most of the Gospels do actually, and, and they begin to look at Jesus' final one-year trek towards Jerusalem and towards Calvary. <clears throat> it started for the most part in Caesarea Philippi, where, where Jesus stopped ministering to the large crowds that had been following him, and he really begins to speak to the disciples and the much smaller group. And his message really becomes more pointed, if you will, because for the first time that year out from the cross, Jesus begins to talk about dying, about going to the cross, about being arrested, about suffering for the sins of the world, and to lay out for his own uh, saints, if you will, those who believed in him, what awaited them at the end of this road. He even mentioned the resurrection and how on three days he would rise from the dead, but to be honest with you, if you've read the Gospels, I think much of that kind of went in one ear and out the other because those that were with him had different expectations of Jesus and why he came. So beginning in, in chapter eight of Mark and then through chapter nine, we get the public ministry kind of aspects of Jesus' life, those three and a half years. And then in chapter 11, where we are this morning, we find that, that final week that leads to Calvary. It's interesting how God kind of narrows the focus in the Gospels as you read them collectively. There are really only four chapters in all of the Gospels that speak about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. You, you then find 85 verses which speak of those three and a half years of ministry publicly where the Lord reached out to those around him and to the world. 29 chapters of those, though, focused on the last week. And then even more so, there are 13 which then focus on the last 24 hours and that which followed. So uh, everything kind of points us to the purpose of God sending his son. He came to die, to save, to rise, and to offer life. It is indeed what we all have enjoyed, hopefully, all of you and I have given our lives to the Lord. And if you're listening and you haven't, well, you'll have a great opportunity this morning to invite Jesus, the Savior of the world, into your life as you consider him on this Palm Sunday. From chapter 19, we learn that, that Jesus, on his way into Jerusalem before this day that we are going to be looking at this morning, had stopped in Jericho. He had ministered there to a a fellow Zacchaeus, a, a short kind of tax collector who, who opened his heart and received the Lord and came to know who he was. Mark tells us that if even just if you go back about, I don't know, a chapter or so in, in your Bibles this morning, back in chapter 10, verse 32, that as Jesus was on the road going to Jerusalem and he was leading his, his disciples, it says that they were amazed and as they followed, they became afraid and so he took the 12 aside and he began to tell them what would happen to them. And he said this to them, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. The son of man is gonna be betrayed to the chief priest, to the scribes. They're gonna condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles and mock him and scourge him and spit upon him and kill him. But on the third day, he would rise again. And we read there even just last chapter about the, the disciples sensed there something was wrong. They, they, they became afraid of Jesus' great determination. He walked with a, as Luke said, with his jaw set. This was, this was his appointment day. This is why he had come. This was the only reason that he was here, to come and to redeem man. And so on the road, they noticed a difference. And, and they were aware. And, and he told them what lie ahead. He repeats it for a year. They, like I said, they're just not listening because they want to hear something else. On that 18-mile journey from Jericho up to Jerusalem, we, we read of, of Jesus' encounter with Bartimaeus, a, a 
fellow born blind, and now he healed him. But, but if we put ourselves with Jesus and a lot of the crowds that were heading into town for this feast day, the, the climb from Jericho, which is about 1,000 feet below sea level, and then to Jerusalem, which is a little bit over 2,500 feet above sea level, and, and all the hill, hills in between, it's a pretty harsh and, and, and arduous climb. Yet, here's where he's heading to this day of presentation to the nation and to the world. We know also from um, John chapter 12 that before of this Sunday morning took place, uh, on the evening before, on Saturday, on the Sabbath, Jesus arrived just really on the backside of the Mount of Olives to Bethany where lived Mary and Martha and Lazarus. You might remember the story. If you don't, you can go and, and read about it there in John chapter 12. It is, oh, the first uh, eight verses or so, but it says that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, and then we read where Lazarus, who was dead and had been raised from the dead, lived, and they made supper. They made the Shabbat dinner uh, there in the house, and, and it says that Martha served and Lazarus sat at the table, but during that um, dinner, Mary took out a, a what, what turned out to be a very expensive pound of a very expensive oil spikenard, as we read in the Bible. She anointed Jesus' feet and then wiped it with her hair, anointing him. And uh, Judas, one of Jesus' disciples at the time, uh, the one who would betray him, we are told, uh, asked about the fragrance in the house and, 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 and what that meant. And, and he said, you know, that was such a waste. It could have been sold for what, what he said would be a, a year's worth of income. If, you know, what a waste of, of, of money and time. We could have given it to the poor. But John writes he had the money box and he was known and prone to kind of help himself to it. But Jesus said to him and to the rest, you leave her alone. She has prepared me for my burial, for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor with you. You won't always have me. And so even the, the day before what we're reading here in, in Mark, Jesus had just spent a couple of miles away and he had had this dinner, and, and, and this had taken place as, as Mary had come just to prophetically, and whether she knew it or not, just to anoint him for his burial, which was now uh, less than a week away. John tells us that many of the Jews in the city during the Passover had come to this house during the week because they had heard about the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead recently. They wanted to know if it was true. They wanted to ask him if it was true. They wanted to, I think, maybe touch him and, and be sure, you know. But, but John writes that because of that, many came to the Lord because of it, began to believe in Jesus. And so uh, God was already doing that great works, but as that was going on up the hill in town, the chief priests and the cohorts were plotting not only to kill Jesus, John 12, verse 10, but to kill Jesus along with Lazarus. Now, just to put an end to this testimony that was being heard. And so, uh, here Mark picks up the story, if you will, on that Sunday morning in Bethany. The word Bethany means house of dates. And then in a little city called Bethphage, which means a house of unripe figs. And he tells this story to us beginning in verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, and to Bethany, on the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Now go into the uh, village opposite you, and as, you, as soon as you've entered in, you'll find a colt that is tied, on which no man has set. Loosen him and bring him. And if anyone says to you, What are you doing this, or why are you doing this? You just say, The Lord has need of him, and immediately he will uh, send you here. And so they went their way and found the colt tied up by the door outside the street, and they loosened it. And some of those who stood by said, what are you doing, loosening the colt? And they just said as the Lord had commanded, you know, the Lord has need of him, and so they let him go. The vista that you get from the Mount of Olives is probably one of the most beautiful that you'll have in all of Israel. Um, because of the hills that surround the city, there is really no better place to look at at the East Gate, to look at the temple area, to look at the place of worship, the entrance into the city. As you get from Jerusalem, we take all of our 
uh, groups there. It is, it is about a mile from there to the entrance across uh, the Kidron Valley, the, the, the place of, of, of Gethsemane is just kind of at the bottom of this hill. And, and we, it is the most remarkable view. And so it is there that Jesus is going to, to ride down, if you will, to present himself to the people. It is, it is from that vantage point that he will come. And so he will ride down the mount towards the entrance of the Jerusalem. We have a, a, a privilege when we are there to, to be able to meet together near the Garden of Gethsemane in a private garden with a, a lock and a key where we just got to get in and, and sit around and read together and, and, and contemplate all of these verses. Uh, hopefully we will be there again in March of this coming year, 2021. So Jesus, on that early Sunday morning, we are told, commissioned or dispatched two of his disciples to go to Bethphage. It seems that uh, upon entering the town, they saw this colt rather quickly. No one had sat upon it. It was a wild animal. They were told to, to loosen it and to bring it back. And if anyone had any questions, that they should um, just tell them the Lord needed it. Because remember, this is God's plan. These are God's issues. This is, this is 4,000 years, if you will, of, of uh, prophecy and, and, and pointing to these things to be so. And so we find ourselves um, just marveling as the Lord puts all of this together. We, we read in, in Luke chapter 19 that there was some questions asked of the boys that they did allow them to go. And, and I always find it so interesting that, you know, the Lord knew every detail, every step. Somehow he had it all arranged. It was all worked out as it always is. This ride would be, like I said, known as the triumphant entry of Jesus. It was, it was uh, kingly in the sense that this was the way that so often victors were presented. If you know anything at all about Roman history, for example, you know that, that when a Roman general went to war and, and fought other countries upon his return home, if he'd been victorious and gained land and all, or gained uh, prisoners of war, or gained booty, if you will, cash or or, or holdings, that, that more often than not there was a new archway built for him. And on the archway relief there were things that would speak about his victory as he rode back you know, to the kingdom. If you've been to Paris, you know that the Arc de Trump is, 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 a, is an arch. It's a fake one. It wasn't really built for anything in particular. If you go to the Roman uh, Forum in Rome, there is a real one there. It was built uh, for Titus when he came back in 71 AD, AD from overthrowing Jerusalem. And so the relief there will show him riding on a horse and holding up the menorah and, and leading the prisoners, the Jews that he took as captors. Um, and so that was a, a typical practice. The motifs would, would, would kind of, the engravings would, would tell you what was going on. Jesus' triumph, though, was a little different. Whereas these kings would ride in, or these generals with, with uh, chariots and and horsemen and, and fighters and, and oftentimes chained uh, prisoners. Jesus was going to ride in, not very noticeably, with a, a group of poor peasants, with ragtag fishermen, with children singing Hosanna in the streets, while the religious folks and the, one, the ones that we would you know, maybe give honor to, at least they did in that culture, stand angrily by. It hardly looks like a triumphant entry at all. It almost looks, you know, like a rebellion or a little bit of a, a foolish revolt, if you will, and, and not much more. And yet, you and I know that there is no more significant victory or conqueror of the word, world that the world has ever seen than Jesus. He's the Lord of all. He's the King of kings. He came to defeat sin and death, to bring, to bring eternal life to every man. No, no more significant than this one. But it didn't look that way on the outside. Matthew, in, in writing his um, gospel, which is a gospel that was written to the Jews, and so you'll find a lot of Jewish Old Testament quotes without much explanation because his audience was expected to know it. He, he quoted out of uh, Zechariah chapter 9, and he said, as he quoted out of Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, you daughter of Zion, and shout, you daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king, he's coming to you. He is just, he has salvation, he is lowly, 
He is riding on a donkey, a, a colt or the foal of a donkey. A, a not so subtle prophecy about this day. And yet it was written in 487 BC. Matthew quotes it. He, he even says as a, a large group of people were following that he said that this is what the prophet says. And, and the, the disciples went and they, they did was Je as Jesus commanded. They got that, that colt because the Lord did need it. This was part of the prophecies that the prophets had spoken so that no one would miss, miss the Messiah that was coming. No ordinary day. This is the day we read that the Lord has made. But, but isn't that always the case? You know, the, the day that you meet the Lord and you know him for who he is and why he came, that's not an ordinary day. That's the day your life goes from death to life, from darkness to light. This is the day your name is found in the book of life and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you and, and the slate against you of your sins and trespasses is, is washed away by his blood. This is no ordinary day, the day that you recognize the Messiah. Well, this was the day that he came to present himself, to show himself to the people, that he might invite them to come and to, to follow him. We just read it. This is the day which the Lord has made let us rejoice in and be glad in it. So the picture from Zechariah is complete here. Notice in verse four here, just tell them that the Lord, uh, or, or sorry, verse uh, six, verse seven, that the Lord has need of him. The Lord has need of him. Um, what, a, what a statement. I, I love the picture of, of the Lord, the creator, the, the Lord of all, saying to the disciples, yeah, you just tell them I have need of that cult. And I love the picture because God, in, 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 in my understanding, at least in the biblical sense, works on the partnership principle. You know, it isn't that he needs us <laughs> or, or that he needs our help. He, he's self-sufficient. He's the Lord over all. And yet he has chosen to work through the lives of those who look to him so that we can partner with God and God partners with us. And so the disciples got to be a part of this day and to see the miracles that had been taking place. You, you go out into the world now and you represent the Lord. And as a result, he kind of condescends to us. He's not ashamed to be called our God. But you'll find that throughout the scriptures. Jesus came to earth and he, he was laid in a, a manger in an animal pen. He, he later borrowed a boat to preach. He... he, he you know, worked out of a house of somebody else in Capernaum to minister to folks. He, he, he rented an upper room or it was given to him. He, he now borrows a donkey that he's about to give back. It won't be about a week. He'll be laid in a borrowed tomb that he'll just need for the weekend. But in every one of those, he didn't need us, but he involves us. And so when the Lord sends the disciples and says, the, the Lord, verse 3, there has need of him. I, I might have missed quoted here a minute ago, but verse three, the Lord has need of him. How important that we realize that the Lord would like to say that to you today. Does he need you? No, but he needs you because this is the way that he has decided to work. So look, there's people on your street don't know the Lord. There are folks in your life now that, that are terrified, that don't know what to think, and you have answers. The Lord has need of you, and if you're willing to go out and to proclaim his word as these disciples just... Oh, what do we tell him? What do you mean the Lord has need of you? That's not going to be enough. They're not going to let me take it. You just tell him what I told you. And God honors his word and he uses it in the lives of those who speak it. So the boys go. The Lord has need. The, the Lord worked. And they found themselves to be useful. Let me ask you something this morning. What do you have that the Lord needs? I don't mean needs in the sense of he can't live without. I mean needs in the sense of he has given them to you so that you could use them in a way that he desires to serve him. It's a pretty interesting picture, isn't it, that these boys get to be a part of this very important day, though they themselves were not yet at all convinced of what he had come to do or why he was doing it. But they were, they were listening, <laughs> and God was about to speak. We read in verse 7 that they brought the colt to Jesus. They they threw their clothes upon it. He sat down, and they spread their clothes on the road, and, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees, spreading them on the ground or on the road, 
And those who went before and those who followed began to cry out, Hosanna. The words mean save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The disciples did what they were told. They found things just as the Lord said. The timing was precise and, and perfect. The day and the hour had been selected from eternity past. And the mode of entry was now God had carefully chosen it. And so Jesus sits down on a wild donkey. Probably not a good idea to follow that example. Um, but like everything else except man, the animals submit to the Lord. You don't find them fighting God. <laughs> we only find man doing that. How exciting must it have been to be in this group in this morning? Because though Jesus had been warning for one year, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be handed over, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise on the third day. And I don't know what he's talking about. He's talking in riddles. And despite all of their warnings that one day he would come and rule, and nothing was going to deter them from believing in their hearts that this was it, that this march into town on a donkey was going to be it. The Romans were out, the Jews were in, we're taken over, it's about time, we've, we've suffered enough. And that was the mindset, not only of the disciples, but everyone that lined the road. And so they began to treat Jesus as royalty. The disciples laid down their clothes on the donkey, the, the crowd laid down their clothes on the road, others cut down these palm branches, that's the term Palm Sunday. And as Jesus began to wind his way down this very, you know, circuitous road down towards the, what would be the entrance to the city across the valley, um, the people began to sing, to wave the palm branches. And you get this beautiful picture, not only of the city, but of the Temple Mount where the worship was going on. Jesus was certainly the center of attention. As the people every day came into Jerusalem, they sang the Hallel Psalms, the Hallelujah Psalms. Um, Psalm 113 through 118. Uh, and, and you can read them. We, had, we read one together this morning. Um, but as you read them, you, you, you can put yourself on the road there and the words begin to mean something as they came to look for the Savior. Up to this point here in our story, Jesus had always withdrawn himself from as much public notice as possible. He actually seemed to run away from public acclaim rather than to, to find it. You, you read in Matthew 12, when he was, after the healing of the, the fellow in the, the synagogue with a withered hand, that the people began to, to come and they, they wanted to kind of make him king and maybe this is the guy and it says in Matthew 12 that Jesus withdrew himself from them, that he, 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 he stepped away. It, that wasn't the plan. His time was not yet. This wasn't the time yet, but today, this was the time. When, when the crowds, after the feeding of what we call the feeding of the 5,000, which was just, you know, men plus women and children, maybe 10,000 or more folks were fed, they, they came in John 6 to forcibly try to make him the king. And again, it says that Jesus walked away as they came with force, and he went into the mountains by himself because it wasn't time yet. And so he walked away from their, their applause. In, in John 7, when, when he told the, his family about maybe going up to Jerusalem for the feast day, they said, you know, if you really want to be attracting attention, if you really want people to believe in you, you should go on a much more public kind of approach and, and, and let yourself be known. But it says that Jesus didn't go and he went in secret, kind of quietly because the time had not come. But this day was different. This is the day that God had been planning for. This was the day that his son would be presented officially as the victor in the world, as the savior, as the fulfillment of literally every scripture that pointed to this day. On this day, Jesus invited, invited honor. He invited the glory. He willfully received the worship. We, we read here in verse nine that that the people cried out. We, Luke records them right, crying out with a loud voice. I miss your singing. I know you didn't always sing. I've looked around. Some of you just sat like this. But many of you sang, and I can't hear any of that right now. But what, what a great time. It isn't worship the best when it sounds really loud? <laughs> and if you put yourself on the Mount of Olives, 
If you sing really loud, you can hear it in town a mile away. If um, Herod had been there in, or I'm, I'm sorry, Pilate had been there in the Antonio Fortress, which was up at the other uh, upper end of the Temple Mount, he would have heard the commotion. Um, we miss that kind of worship. We don't have it now, but we'll have it again. And hopefully you're all home practicing and uh, bring your voices with you. Even bass voice, we'll take bad voices at this point. Horrible voices. Because God's tone deaf. He just looks at the heart. Anyway, notice that we read here in verse 9 and in verse 10 that the, the people began to take a portion of that Hillel psalm. In fact, these are verses that, that come out of Psalm 118. We read them this morning. Where, where they began to say, save now, which is the word for Hosanna. It is the cry of a people for their Messiah, for their deliverance. This was their expectation. This was their emotional outlook. Like I said, they haven't been listening because they have a different opinion. A lot of people today, they don't hear the gospel because they figured out, this is how I get to heaven. This is what I do. This is what God wants. This is what I'm willing to offer. If he's not happy with that, I got nothing. Well, that's, that's foolish because he writes the rules. He's God. You know you, you know that old thing about it's my ball, I'm taking it home? Well, it's, 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 this is his world. And, and he'll demand of us what he desires. So he, he, being a good God, has provided a way. They saw Jesus as a deliverer, but not in the way that they hoped for. And so as they began to be, you know, kind of frantic in their, in their singing, what they longed for was a political deliverer, someone who would lead Israel out from under the Romans. And the fact that he had said clearly and constantly, I'm coming to die, you know, I'm, I'm coming to give my life, this same group of singers would by the end of the week be singing a different song. And they would be screaming for his blood. We have no king but Caesar. We don't want this man to rule over his, us. May his blood be upon us, upon our children. Why? Because he didn't fit into their expectations. You know, the salvation that God provides through his son will probably not fit into yours either. We have learned over the years in our world <laughs> That, that it's all about what we earn. It's about our own efforts and, and, and our intentions. But there's a bigger problem that we have sin in our hearts. We've fallen short, and, and, and you can't hide that in your life or anybody else's. You can see it. So our goodness can't get rid of the sin, which requires death. We sin, we die. God has a better plan. He'll die in your place eternally through his son. You get life. Simple as that. There's this exchange. That's God's plan. You know, I don't like it. Well, you may not like it, but it's his plan. Well, it doesn't seem right. Look, it doesn't matter what looks like right to you. What, what, what looks right to him? What does he consider? And so the people were thrilled, but they didn't see a need for him in their own lives. And, 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 and they didn't need him as far as they could understand. They just wanted him to take over and their life would go on without it, 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 I think it explains clearly what, what Luke will write in a few verses about this in chapter 19, that as Jesus came close to the city, as everyone cheered, he wept. <laughs> it's, it's such an odd picture. You know, Jesus, 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 and he's starting to weep. If you'd have known, especially you in this your day, this your day, the things that belong to your peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. And so, because you're not listening, you don't want to believe, the days are coming when your enemies are going to build an embankment against you, the city, they're going to surround the city, they're going to close you in on every side, they're going to dash you and your children to the ground. There won't be one stone left upon another. And then there's a comment that says, because you didn't know the time of your visitation. Or if you will, you didn't listen when God said, this is what life is all about, and you wouldn't hear him what judgment's all about, just refusing God's plan. You see it all on the, on the Palm Sunday that led to the cross, that led to the empty tomb. If you'd have known, just in this your day, so as they cheered, Jesus wept, and the word weep there is strongest Greek word known in the language, uncontrollable sobbing, that, this, that almost you can't catch your breath, you're beside yourself, settle down. <laughs> the suffering that he saw in their faces, the hurt that he knew they would face, it broke his heart. He came to save. He comes to save you. 
But if you won't listen, he'll weep because his intention is that you would have life. Especially in this your day. This day was so important because, for one thing, this was the 10th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar, in the, in the, in the calendar for your Passover. It was the day the family went out and picked a, a, a young lamb, a young lamb to bring her into the house to, to sleep in your bed, to sit at your table, to, to hug the kids, a lamb that was slated to be slain as a Passover sacrifice. Why the interaction so that the sacrifice would be felt, that the, that the sacrifice would be known to kids and adults alive. This little lamb that had done nothing wrong, that, that, that everyone was just thrilled with, now had to give his life so that we could you know, be passed over in, in terms of judgment. It was a picture of Jesus. He, this was the day that Jesus was presented as the Lamb of God to the nation. This your day. I know that we won't look at it again this morning, but I would encourage you to go back and look at a prophecy that Daniel gave us back in chapter 9 of Daniel's uh, little book, beginning in verse 24 through verse 27. Um, about seven, no, 570 years earlier than what we're reading this morning, um, Daniel the prophet was in his 90s. He was spending time with all of Judah in captivity. He was a little bit of a um, prophecy buff, I guess. He was reading the book of Jeremiah when he realized, gosh, we're supposed to be in captivity for 70 years, and those 70 years are almost up. And he began to pray. He, he prayed according to what we read there in a way that only you know you find in, in, in godly men like Daniel, he, he prayed again that, Lord, we are here by our own sin. He, he repented for himself and for the nation that he represented and, and that he was a part of. He, he, he asked the Lord to show him what might come next. And even at 90, could I play a role in the repatriation of, of the land? And the Lord, in, as he was praying, sent the angel Gabriel to him to give him an answer. And it was a far greater answer than he ever, I think, expected. Because what follows there in those four verses is a word from the Lord that, that is a word for God's complete dealing with the nation of Israel from the time of Daniel's prayer to the time of the Lord's return. So you, you are given a, a, a picture of God's dealing, not with individuals, not Jews or Gentiles, but with, an, with Israel, the people that he chose for himself. Um, what follows in those, uh, in, in those verses is God's national plan. And they fall into kind of a couple of different categories. I would recommend it to you a, a book I've re recommended for years. It was a, a book written by a fellow named Robert Anderson, uh, Sir Robert Anderson. He was the head of Scotland Yard for years, but he was, he was a man who deeply loved the Lord. He went through the, pro uh, the promise there from the Lord to Daniel, worked out with great clarity and preciseness the, the times, and we have a lot to, to be thankful for. Daniel writes there in chapter 9, verse 24, 70 sevens are determined upon my people, uh, or your people and your city, if you will, to finish the transgression, to bring an end to sin, to bring reconciliation for your iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the, the, the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And so as you begin to read, God speaks about six very important things that are going to happen during this 77-year periods. The, the words are Shabuah, Shabai, uh, Shabiyom, Shabiyom, yes. Um, 77s, that's really what the words uh, are, are translated. It, it, is, it literally means here's 77 year periods in which God will accomplish these things. And he lists three, uh, six of them. Three of them are negative. Three of them are very positive. Um, three of them deal with sin. The, the last three deal with God's kingdom. The first three are, are accomplished when Jesus comes here to die. He comes to finish transgression. He comes to... Um, to deal with, if you will, um, our, our, our sin, to make an end, to make reconciliation for our iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. All of those are accomplished with his death. Um, to make an end of sin or to reconcile, to bring us back to the Lord. Um, the word reconcile is the word kafar, to cover. Um, the last three, 
that, that Daniel mentions are to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision, anoint the most holy. All of that takes place when the Lord returns uh, to rule and to reign upon the kingdom. But in the, in the meantime, we have this 77-year period where all of those things are accomplished. As you continue to, to read, uh, Daniel goes on and he says very clearly, um, there will be seven weeks and then there'll be seven, 62 weeks, that's 69 weeks, and then there'll be a 70th week and he breaks them up and he tells them that for 62 weeks from the time that Daniel is being told um, until the Messiah comes will be six, six, uh, 70, 62 weeks of seven year periods. Um, and then he adds uh, he'll be cut off but not for himself. Before that, there'll be seven sevens of 49 years where the city will be built and all and, and the roads will be finished. And so Daniel gives to us a, a, a very clear timeline of, of God's dealing with and his promise for keeping this special day when the Lord will come. And so if you go back into the Old Testament, we, we, we read that, that God through Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah a commandment it was March 6th, uh, 445 B.C. And he said, now go and restore the city. And from that day, we then begin to count these, what is six, seven weeks, and then 62 weeks, or 69 weeks of years. Um, 173,880 days, I believe, when you use the Babylonian calendar. And, in, and counting the leap years in, Sir Robert Anderson determined that the Messiah should show up to present himself to the nation on the 1st of Nisan, which is April 6th, 32 AD. And so I think you can label this chapter April 6th, 32 AD, the day that the Lord had made for his son to ride into town on a donkey as the, the, the people sang the the praise songs of the coming Messiah, and, and, and everything fits together. Jesus would be cut off, but not for himself, but he came to make an end to sin, to provide reconciliation for men that have fallen into iniquity, to, pr to bring everlasting righteousness to someone's life. And he came to do that. Why did, then did Jesus weep? Because the nation around him wasn't willing to believe in him. And so he had come to save, but... He, he can't save those that refuse him. Within 37 years of what we're reading, um, the Roman army will come, the 10th legion, uh, under Titus, and will destroy Jerusalem. Will send every Jew in town running for their lives. And by the, second, by the 71 AD, everyone will have left town. And there won't be a Jewish state until 19. 48, when God is again bringing them home. So there, there's been these seven sevens, the, the building of the city under Nehemiah and others. There's been this 62 more weeks of, of years that bring us to uh, April 6, uh, 32 AD. And then there's this one seven-year period left, and that, that, that's on hold now because God's not dealing with national Israel right now. He's dealing with the world individually. So Gentiles and Jews get saved individually. But when the rapture of the church takes place and God is through with the church age, then there's a seven-year period still awaiting us, the tribulation, God's final seven years of dealing with the world, reaching out to them by a vehicle mostly through his nation, through his people. And then that'll be it. The Lord will come and establish you know, himself, if you will, upon the earth to anoint the most holy and all, seal up the prophecies and the vision and all, everything will be fulfilled at that point. So when you read in here, in this your day, it should move your heart because this was indeed the day that the Lord had made. And if anybody was paying attention, reading their Bibles, looking at what we saw even in the Psalms, they would have at least entertained the idea that maybe this is the Messiah. The problem for them was they didn't apply it personally to themselves, and maybe you don't either. You talk about God, I know God, I believe in God, I love God, I pray. Great, but do you know Jesus? Is he the Lord and Savior of your life? Because there is a day that God presents himself to you and you either believe him or you don't. And if you don't, judgment's got to follow. And it isn't his fault. He came to give you life. If, if you read ahead historically, um, 
we will read in, in the Bible that when the Lord comes back, they will look upon him whom they've pierced. They will recognize him as the Messiah, but for now, they reject him. In fact, Josephus writes of the invasion of, of Jerusalem in 70 AD that over 600,000 people lost their life on the first day. Why did Jesus weep? It didn't have to be like that. He came to save. This was the day of presentation, and they didn't realize it. The prophets had declared it. The scriptures had said so, and still they refused. You read in John chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own, but his own received him not. So there was trouble waiting for many, and, and the Lord's heart broke as a result. We read in verse 11 as we end this morning, and Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple, and, and when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. And so Jesus, as we learn from the Gospels, would spend this last Passover week in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus up on the Mount of Olives in the little town of, of, of Bethany. And he would stay there uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday night we will find him uh, in the garden being arrested. So um, we're getting kind of to the end. A couple of things I think we should learn this morning as we look forward to Easter. One is God's always in charge of everything. We certainly should better learn that now with all that we're going through. You know, everything is, is upside down, and yet the Lord is in control. My peace, he's in, he's in control. I'm not worried a bit. God is in control. Whatever he wants, he's going to have. So we might as well just run with God. Um, Jesus came to die, and, and this week he would die. The, the religious leaders had determined in Matthew 26, let's not kill him during the Passover. There's way too many people here. And he's kind of a big deal. We'll probably have a riot on our hands. Let's wait till they leave, and then we'll take care of them. That wasn't God's plan, even though it was a man's. As with our salvation, so with our walks, it's, it's one thing to say you believe in him. It's another thing to, to, to live for him, to obey him, to follow his word, to rely upon his work. God wants to use you. I, I can say to you clearly, he has need of you, not in that sense of dependency, but in that sense of plan. God wants to use your life. If you, if you set that aside, he'll find someone else. But you'll miss out. He won't. He'll still have his way. So we need to be available to him. His timing is perfect. Nothing can thwart his plans. His sacrifice and his resurrection is the only hope that all of us can have. And on that day, we'll have great joy. And the Lord will either rejoice over you or he'll weep. He can't do both. Maybe this is your morning, this Sunday morning, a week before Easter. This is the one day that God planned to bring you to himself. Maybe you'll realize you have need for him in that sense. Without him, you can't be saved. If you'll come to him, he'll, re he'll receive you and he'll give you life. That's really what Easter is all about. So when we have our study on Wednesday night, when we're gonna look at some of Jesus' dealing in town during this final week, when we meet on Good Friday to talk about what does it mean to, to, to go to the cross, when we talk at Easter about what the Lord accomplished for us. It, it all ties back to his purposes here. Today is the day the Lord has made to save you. If you're not saved, come and be saved. That's God's heart and his invitation. Father, thank you this morning as we sit together for your word to us and how important it is that, that we look at this day, this Easter week, this Palm Sunday as the day where, Lord, you had made, made this plan for, for thousands of years. It was your plan to arrive on that day and present yourself in this way and to, and to head for the cross with determination and, and, and love, knowing that this is the only way that we could be saved. And so as we sit together in, in our homes with our children, maybe with friends listening this morning, may we not miss the fact that that, that special day is still available to us the day when the Lord makes himself known to the heart and he becomes the Lord of it. <laughs> and we throw down our coats and we, we sing his praises and we acknowledge that, that he saves now. This is the day he's made come and save now and that you might save us. And the Lord will do that for you if you ask. Just invite him in. Pray, Lord, save me. Forgive me of my sins. And he will hear your prayer and he will do what he promised to do. And then, if you like, call the church tomorrow 
We'll be open all day. Just say, hey, I want to talk to the pastor. I pray to receive the Lord. I'd like to have someone, you know, just go over it with me. Call us tomorrow morning. We'll be happy to do that. Or go to our website even today, and, and you can look at what it means to be saved. There'll, there'll be lots of information there for you as well. All right, let's sing this last song together, and, and we'll look forward to this Easter week. Be with us. Invite your friends. Let's make this a, a, a special time as the Lord has given us this opportunity. rising eyes are turning to you we turn to you hope is stirring hearts are yearning for you we long for you Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, are washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saved us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saved us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. So come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Father, how thankful we are that this is Easter week and we have at the end of the week great hope for eternal life. But the story doesn't end with a rest or the crucifixion. It ends with an empty tomb. So may we acknowledge this in this our day that Jesus, you came to save. And in you we have great hope. And this is your purpose. May you not have to weep over us one day. May you rejoice as we make a determination to follow you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Sorry we're missing you, but we'll see you soon, and we love you.